several years ago in my life, I went through a period of time when God was very, very close to me. I had, for a two or three month period, several experiences of God that were very intense and very real. Uh, God spoke to me on a few occasions during that time, and I saw two or three very specific answers to prayer over about a three month period of time. At the end of that time, it became very clear to me that God was going to withdraw his presence from me, and he did. And I went into a period of over two years where God was largely silent in my life. I did not sense his presence. Uh, my prayer life seemed like it got no higher than the ceiling, and it seemed for all I could tell that God had just abandoned me. Though I knew intellectually he was present, I had very little in terms of sensing his presence for that period of time. And I say this to you because it is a normal thing for people to experience the absence of God or his silence. This is not abnormal. And if this is happening to you, join the club. This is a part of the testimony of our people ever since there's been a church. And this is going to be an important theme uh, tonight and tomorrow especially uh, to help understand why this happens and what you can do about it. But I have a slightly different concern this evening because I believe that many times we think God is being silent when in fact he's speaking to us, but we just don't know how to hear him or discern his voice. And what I want to talk about this evening is hearing God and having God speak to you. And I want to do that in two steps. The first thing I would like to do is to give you a little biblical basis for the fact that we can expect God to speak to us today, even outside Scripture, though Scripture is always the primary place that God speaks. But I will give a biblical basis for that, and then I'm going to explain different ways that God speaks to us and how to improve in discerning His voice in that particular way. So is, does the Bible indicate to us that we ought to expect to hear God speak to us? And if the answer to that question is yes, how does he speak? And how can we learn to discern his voice in more effective ways? The Bible does indeed tell us that we can expect God to speak to us. And I think this is true in at least three different areas of life. The first is found in Philippians 3.15, where the Apostle Paul makes a very interesting statement uh, in the context, he's talking about uh, having an attitude of maturity in Christ. And in a very specific part of verse 15 of chapter 3, he says the following, Let us therefore, as many as are mature, have this attitude, that, this attitude of wanting to grow and be mature according to what he's just said. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you. He'll make it known. The word reveal there is the same word as used to reveal the scriptures. And the promise is that if we are walking in a way that is not according to the way God wants us to walk, he'll make that known to us. And I can't tell you the number of times in my life when something has come to me from the Spirit of God saying to me, Jay, that is not the way you should go, or you need to apologize to your wife, or there is something that you've done that's not appropriate, and God speaks to us and reveals to us ways that we have gone away from Christ's path for us, and that's very important. Now, let me say something to you about that. When God speaks in that corrective kind of way, he does not speak in a guilt-producing, condemnatory tone. If you start feeling a sense of condemnation for your behavior, or you start feeling a sense of, of overwhelming guilt, and uh, you start getting down on yourself, that is not the voice of God. That's either the voice of the dark side or it's just your own psychology, uh, a self-image. But God does not speak to his children that way. Does he convict? Yes. Does he discipline? Yes. But it is for the purpose of, of a restoration and redemption. It is not condemnatory. So as you learn to discern God's voice, as he speaks to you to correct you, and to make sure you're walking in the way he wants you to walk, pay careful attention to the tone of that voice. If the tone of that voice is clear and if it points out 
this is, this is not something you should be doing or you're moving in the wrong direction. And it has a sense of hope and of encouragement. That's likely to be the Lord speaking to you. If it's condemnatory, that's not the way the Lord talks. Now, there's another area where God speaks to us that's related to this one. And this is found in 1 Corinthians 2.14. This verse has been confused. And I want to make sure that we uh, have a chance to understand what it's saying. Uh, so what I'd like to do is read it to you and then explain what I think it means. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him, and he can't understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Now, this passage has sometimes been used to indicate that the Holy Spirit is needed to understand the meaning of the Bible. I don't think that's true. I don't think that we need the Holy Spirit to understand what the biblical text means. A non-Christian who does not have the Spirit of God, who studies the Word carefully and uses the proper principles of interpreting literature, can understand the meaning of the Bible every bit as good as a Spirit-filled Christian. The difference is he won't buy it and he won't apply it to his life. It won't mean anything to him. And what this text means is that the Holy Spirit promises to take the Word when it's taught to you or when you study it and to speak to you about it and to warm your heart to it, to make you receptive to it, and to apply it to your life. This is why when you're sitting under the teaching of the Scriptures, one of the things you ought to do is to say before someone is speaking or before you begin to read, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. And give the Spirit of God permission to speak to your mind and your heart about the significance of the application of that text to your, to your life. Does the Holy Spirit speak to us? Yes. And he does so specifically in the area of revealing to us the application of Scripture so that our hearts will be warmed and strengthened. Otherwise, the Bible would be just a dead book, but the Spirit of God makes it alive as he speaks to us as we study and have it taught to us. Now, there's another area where God speaks to us, which I think is extremely important, and this is in the area of guidance. And if you have a Bible, please turn uh, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. In this context, Jesus is talking about his sheep, and he says some very important things. Beginning in verse 3, he says, to him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Verse 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And verse 27, Jesus summarizes this by saying, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, what's important about this is that you can learn to discern the voice of Jesus Christ in your life for guidance. Now, I want to be very cautious here because God has a specific will for your life, but he doesn't have a will for everything you do. Indeed, there are texts in the Old Testament when, for example, David was seeking the Lord's guidance, and the Lord said to David, do whatever is in your heart, and I will go with you. And in that context, what God was saying is, I don't have a will for you on this matter. I want to know what you want to do, and you choose, and I will back you or go with you. On other occasions, God does have a will for us, and he has something specific he wants us to do. And there is an indication that he will speak to us just like he spoke to people in biblical times. Now, I want you to come to the point in your life where you believe that what happened to the people in Bible times can happen to you. The way God spoke to people in the times of Scripture, he still speaks to people today. Now, one of the reasons we don't believe that is that we tend to over-supernaturalize the way God spoke to people in the, in the Scriptures. For an illustration, turn to Acts 13. Acts 13. 
I'm going to read Acts 13 too, and I want you to think about it with me for just a minute. Acts 13 too. It says, and while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Now, if you're not careful, you're going to read that text, and you're going to think that when it says the Holy Spirit said, that there was literally an audible sound that surrounded that room. That may very well have been what happened, but I suspect that that's not what happened. I suspect that what happened is that the Spirit of God spoke in the hearts of those seeking him and brought consensus to the group as they were deliberating. I have seen this kind of thing happen many times in, in meetings of elders and other groups where God spoke into the hearts of the people deliberating and brought consensus. Why do I mention this? If you read that passage and you tend to think that what's being talked about there is the hearing of an audible voice, which does happen today. But if you think, well, what happened was the hearing of an audible voice, you're liable to think, well, gosh, what's wrong with me? That never happens to me. And the truth of the matter is, it may very well not have been an audible voice. It may have been a type of speech that where God has spoken the same way to you on a number of occasions. The key, I think, is learning how to discern when God is doing that. So does the Bible teach us that the God of the Christian religion speaks to his children outside Holy Scripture. It does. He will apply the Scriptures to us. He will help us if we're going in the wrong direction, and he will give us guidance and speak to us in a number of ways. And he speaks to little people and big people and all kinds of people. There are no unimportant people in the kingdom of God, and God, the Holy Spirit, will speak to all of us if we seek him and learn to discern his voice. Now, this raises the question, how does God speak? And what can I learn about this for my own life? I want to list to you six different ways God speaks to people. And my desire here is to open your heart and your mind to the speaking of God in your life. Six ways that God speaks. There are more, but these are what I believe the six most important key ways that God speaks to people today. The first is through what is called the gift of prophecy or words of knowledge, or words of wisdom. We won't turn there, but if you were to look at 1 Corinthians 14.1, for example, the Apostle Paul says, desire earnestly that you may prophesy. And then a few verses later it says, prophesying is for edification and encouragement. Now, this is what sometimes is called a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a prophetic word. And it's when God gives you something for someone and you can have the privilege of sharing it with them and it is a way where God speaks through a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom to someone who is listening to them. Let me give you an illustration of this in my own life. A few years ago, I went to Vanguard University to speak at a summer camp that was being held on campus there were about 130 Korean Americans from 35 states around the country that were there for eight weeks. And during that eight week period of time, they were largely being taught by people who were staying with them for the eight week period. But they were gonna have maybe four or five outside speakers, maybe one every two or three weeks during that eight week period. I spoke on a Thursday night, a Friday morning, and I was gonna speak on Saturday morning. I went to speak Friday night, and there was a worship service going on, so I sat in the back and said to the Lord, Lord, is there anything you would like to say to them? And the Lord said to me, there is a young man here named Mike. Before he came here, he had a confrontation with his pastor. He has blamed himself for that confrontation, but it was his pastor's fault, not his, and he needs to confront his pastor about what he did to him. There are also students here that are being demonized, and they're not able to sleep at night, and I want you to deliver them from the demonic. Now, I was about 70-30, it was the Lord's voice. Uh, when, the, when, when God speaks to me, I'm, either, I'm somewhere between 50-50 and 90-10. Uh, I'm never 100-0, because I'm not even sure as a philosopher that the physical universe is real. So you'll have to, you understand, I have kind of a philosophical sliding scale here. 
But I was about 70-30. And I'll explain a little bit later how I knew that. But for right now, the lesson is that when God speaks to you, you don't have to be certain it's the Lord. If you're 70-30, then that's an important thing. And I was. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm not going to do it. Because I said, I've never met a Korean American in my life named Mike, and there's not going to be anybody here named Mike. I really honestly said that to the Lord. And then I said, no, I don't think I can do that. I need to do it. So I got up and I spoke in apologetics. When it was finished, I said to the group, I have a sense that the Lord wants me to say, and I said this. And I said, I'd like for you to get up and get into groups of seven or eight, and I let them get in groups, and I said, would you just close your eyes? And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ and the authority of his kingdom and his shed blood on the cross, I command any demon that's bothering one of my brothers and sisters to leave now in the name of Jesus and not come back. And then I said, I'd like for you to stay in an attitude of prayer and pray for one another. I left, and I looked at my watch, and it was 1020. I came back the next morning to speak at 9.30. I drove into the parking lot about 9 o'clock, and the director of the conference ran out to my car. And he said, do you know what happened last night? Well, no, I went home. Um, He said, after you left the room, the Holy Spirit came into the meeting so powerfully that students were up weeping and confessing their sins till 2.30 this morning. I thought that was encouraging, except it happened when I left. I don't know. Um, You be the judge on that. And then he said to me, have you met Mike? (laughs) And I said, you mean there really is a Mike here? And he said, there's one guy named Mike. And he's right over there, and he needs to talk to you. So Mike comes up to me, and he says, Dr. Moreland, how in the world did you know that? And I said, well, I was 70-30, but that's what I sensed the Lord gave me. And I felt it was my obligation to share it with you. And he said, you have no idea the significance of what your word was to me. And here here it is. I live in New Jersey, and before I came out here, my girlfriend and I went to see our pastor. And he said some very demeaning things to me and my girlfriend. And they, they felt really bad and funny and sort of inappropriate. But as we left, I said to my girlfriend, you know, he's a godly man. It had to be my fault. It couldn't have been his fault. And so I just brushed it off, but I've been wrestling with it all summer, and you're not going to believe it. But we have four outside speakers this summer. One of them is my pastor from New Jersey, and he's flying in tomorrow. And now I know I need to tell him what he did. On another occasion, I was at our church, the Anaheim Vineyard, and we had about 1,500 people there for worship. Uh, there was a pastor friend of mine from Berkeley who had come to the worship conference, and he was sitting somewhere near us. At the end of the service, he went forward. uh, There was a time for people to go forward for prayer. I'd say 200 people went forward, and he went. So I decided that I would follow him, so I walked up behind him, and I laid my hands on his shoulder and just stood there, and I said, Lord, I'm listening. And the word came to me, tell him that I see him and that I approve of his ministry. Now, I've learned that when you have a sense of that, you should give exactly what you heard and nothing more, nothing less. And so I said, I said, Pastor Ed, I have the sense that God wants you to know that he sees you and that he approves of your ministry. He turns around and starts weeping uncontrollably. And I, I didn't know what was going on. I said, Ed, what's going on? He said, JP, before this meeting started, I was sitting in the back of the congregation. And I said, Lord, do you even see me? Do you approve of my ministry? Would, would you let me know tonight that you see me and that you approve of my ministry? And now I know that he does. Now, here's a tip. The best way that I have learned to discern God speaking in this way has been when I pray for people. And so here's what I would encourage you to do. If you're going to pray for somebody and you have a minute, ask for permission to lay hands on the person, put your hand on their shoulder or something, and before you start praying, ask the Lord if he wants to say something. Say, Lord Jesus, we're at peace, we're here, 
we're listening if there's something you'd like to say. And then wait and see if something comes. And if something comes to you, share it. Now, don't say, thus saith the Lord, uh, or, you know, this is, this is Acts chapter 29 or something of that sort. I typically will say something like, the Lord seems to be saying, or this is what I'm getting, or does this make sense to you? And you will find in those circumstances that God does speak to people. The second way God speaks to people is through dreams and visions. This is very important. In fact, in Acts 2.17, we are promised that in the latter days, and I believe we're, we are in those days since the advent of the first coming, that people of all kinds will see dreams and receive visions, and that will be part of the expectation of the Christian church. What's interesting to me is that Christians all over the world, China, South America, Africa, regularly see visions and dreams. It happens to be Christians in North America that don't have this happen to them very much because we don't tend to be very open to this kind of thing. Let me give you some examples of this. There's a professor that I teach with at Talbot School of Theology, I won't mention his name, but he, he told me once that his wife regularly hears from God in dreams. And he said, there have been several times when God has spoken to my wife in a dream and what God told her came true. And he said, I, when my wife has a dream, I listen very carefully to what she has to say, unless it's that God wants them to take out the trash or something like that. That's a whole different, of course, thing. But that is an example of God speaking to people in a dream. Two nights ago, I was at Rolling Hills Covenant Church, and I was speaking to a, a man from Australia who told me how he came to the Lord. One day, he was, he was an unbeliever. He was walking in the middle of the day in a large city down the sidewalk in a crowded city. And all of a sudden, he had a vision. Now, by a vision, you know what it's like to have an intense daydream? When you daydream and it's very intense, that's what happened to him. He had a very intense vision of a long hillside with a cross on top of it where Jesus said to him, I died and rose from the dead three times. He knew nothing about Christianity, but he knew that it had something to do with the Bible. So he went home on the basis of that vision, and he read the New Testament, and he came to an understanding of the gospel, and he became a Christian through reading the scriptures because God appeared to him in a day vision and spoke to him. Two weeks ago, a friend of mine uh, told me a story about when she went, uh, it's actually a, a, a friend of mine told me a very close friend of his went to the supermarket recently, actually out here in Southern California, and she was in the checkout line, and right in front of her was a, was a Middle Eastern Muslim-looking man. She got a strong impression that she was to, he, and he picked up a copy of the National Enquirer. She got a strong sense that God wanted her to tell him to put it down. <laughs> and she was a very quiet person. She wasn't prone to that kind of um, aggressive activity. So she looked at this man and said, you know, sir, that's not good for your soul. You really ought to put that down. <laughs> well, he turned around and looked at her and said, listen, you are a holy woman. You are a holy woman. And he repeated that about three times. She was so encouraged by his response, she said to him, Sir, after we've checked out here at the supermarket, would you meet me out front? I'd like to talk to you about something. He said, I will. He checked out. She checked out behind him. She went out to the front of the supermarket, gave him a four spiritual laws booklet, and said, If you'll read this, it will tell you how to become a child of God, which is not the usual way she speaks. She would usually say, it will tell you how to come to know Christ in a personal way. But she said, it will tell you how to become a child of God. He dropped to his knees. And he said, ma'am, you have no idea what you said to me. Last night, God appeared to me in a dream and told me that today I would meet someone who would tell me how to become a child of God. And you are that person. Is, is that incredible? God still speaks to people you bet, you bet. God still speaks to people in dreams and visions. Now, what do you do about this? Listen, 
a number of the dreams we have are purely psychological. They're the, the subconscious working out trauma and stress. So if you have a dream, it doesn't automatically mean it's supernatural or from the Lord. <clears throat> you want to be careful about that. However, our tendency is not that tendency. Our tendency is to dismiss all dreams and have none of them come from the Lord. So here is my advice to you. This is what I've done in my own life. If you have a dream and you think it could be from God, you're not sure, you don't know, but it could be, don't just dismiss it. Instead, run it by some wise friends, share the dream with them and say, what do you make of this? Do you think God is speaking to me in this dream? And if so, what do you think he's trying to say? There's wisdom in many counselors. So my warning is that not all dreams are from the Lord, and I have no idea what the percentage is. I would dare say most of them are just normal. But I do know that God still speaks to people in dreams, and so my advice would be to start, if you want God to guide you, start opening up to dreams, and if you have one that you think may be from the Lord, run it by your friends and see what they say. Why would God speak in a dream? The answer is, I think, that it's easier to bypass your resistance while you're sleeping. I'm really serious about that. Your guard is down, and God could get through to you. I am praying for a specific individual right now that God will speak to him tonight and tomorrow night in his sleep because there's something I believe he needs to know, and I'm not going to tell it to him. I want God to tell him. If it's not something God wants to tell him, God won't. But I'm praying that he'll speak to him in his sleep because my sense is he would be resistant to it when he was awake. <laughs> so it's a little sneaky of me, but in any case, that's the way it works. Number three, in addition to, in addition to prophecy and dreams and visions, God puts thoughts and feelings in our minds. He puts thoughts and feelings in our minds. Uh, the a key text on this, please write this down if you're taking notes. We won't look at it because of time, but it's Nehemiah 2.17. Nehemiah 2.17. In that text, Nehemiah said that I am now going to do what the Lord is putting in my mind to do. And he had the experience of a set of thoughts and ideas that came to him from God. Now, how do you discern when it's God and when it's just a pizza that you had? How do you discern it? The answer is, through trial and error and practice, just like you learn to discern the Bible. When, you, when I first picked up the Bible as a new convert, I'll bet 80% of the interpretations I gave were false. I thank God for forgiving me of my teaching in those first six months. But I, I suspect I butchered the Bible pretty badly. I had a good heart. I had to learn to discern the meaning of Scripture as I grew older in the Lord. The same thing is true in discerning God's voice. Here is the way God's voice tends to come to me. First of all, it feels like it's coming from outside me instead of bubbling up from inside of me. And it comes in a series of thoughts that just flow through me, and then they leave. They're not naggy. They're not superficial. They're just a series of very clear thoughts that that I wasn't thinking about something, and all of a sudden, a series of thoughts will come through my mind, and then they're gone. And um, there is a certain tone to them, and most of the time, not all the time, <clears throat> God will speak to me in the first person. Instead of uh, the, 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 the thought being, God wants you to such and such, it is, I want you to such and such. And so you learn to discern when something feels like it's coming from the outside, there's a tone to it and a certain texture that you will learn to recognize as time goes on. Let me give you an illustration. I was on my back porch a few years ago, and I was thinking about my day, and all of a sudden, the thought came to me, I want you to edit a series of books honoring my word and different academic disciplines with InterVarsity Press. Now, I'm, I kid you not, that came to me. It was, it was clear. It just flowed through my mind. And I said to the Lord, I said, if this is you, may I have help doing this? And nothing came to me. 
So when I don't get anything after a while, I assume that I can do whatever is in my heart, and that's perfectly fine. So I don't sit around waiting for God to speak to me. I'm active. I step out and live my life, but I retain a spirit of openness for God to speak. Does that make sense to you? So it's not I'm sitting around waiting. I'm active in my life, but I I try to maintain an open perspective so God can speak if he wants to. So in this particular case, he said nothing about that. So I called a friend of mine, Frank Beckwith at Baylor University, told him what had happened and said, would you edit a series of books with me? And I think InterVarsity is going to publish it. So I came, I came up with a proposal, sent it to InterVarsity Press, and they said, we're not interested. Now I can remember thinking, that's not the way this was supposed to work out. And I was pretty confident it was God who'd spoken to me. So I did something I've never, I had never done in my publishing career up until that point. I took the proposal and reworked it, and I sent it back to the publisher and said, would you please look at it one more time? That's usually not a good idea, because you can badger a publisher and they remember those things. But I went ahead and did it. Well, Andy LePoe at InterVarsity Press looked at the new proposal, and he called me and said, we really like this, we're going to publish it. And now there is a series of seven volumes that are out on what's called the Christian Worldview Integration Series. Paul Spears, John Coe, Gary DeWeese, Tim, uh, I'm thinking of Tim Pickavance. Tim, you're here. My dear brother Tim in the communication department. Yeah, Mulehoff, I had a senior moment. I was thinking of Tim Pickavance. He wrote one of them. And uh, a number of Biola faculty wrote this. Uh, God wasn't speaking to me then, let me tell you. (laughs) I was having a senior moment. But in any case, but that was a case where God spoke to me. Um, I had another experience where I went out jogging, and I was going through a period of very serious personal depression and anxiety. This happened nine years ago. And uh, we were undergoing some very, very serious financial difficulty. And on the way back from jogging, I said to the Lord, Lord, I would like to hear your voice more frequently than I'm hearing it. And it came to me, why don't you ask me to do something for you? It was a very clear tone. Like I said, it felt like it was coming from outside of me and like it was being given to me rather than bubbling up from within my heart. I said, Lord, if this really is you, what should I ask? And and the Lord said, why don't you ask me for $5,000 before the day's over with? Well, I was all eager to do that, and I said, Lord, if this really is you, would you grant that request? And I figured something would come in the mail. The mail came and left, no check. I didn't know what to make of it, but at 5 o'clock, 5.20 actually that evening, uh, my wife and I, who's here, uh, we received $5,200 just like the Lord had promised. That was an occasion where God put thoughts and feelings in my mind and spoke to me. Now, have I ever been wrong? Yes. Have there been times I thought God spoke to me and he didn't? Yes. Have there been times I thought the scriptures taught a certain thing and it doesn't? Yes, I've misinterpreted the Bible and I've also misinterpreted the Spirit's voice to me. So, do you need to be wise? Yes, but I'm here to tell you God still speaks to people and guides them. And and if you look for uh, him to put thoughts and feelings in your mind, he'll do it. By the way, a tip on this. I have found it, maybe it's because I'm an analytic thinker, but I found it unhelpful to just sit down in a chair and say, Father, speak to me. Because when I do that, whatever comes, I'm thinking, was that God or wasn't it God? Was it God or wasn't it God? That's not been helpful to me. Here's what I found helpful. I will do something that, is, that, that requires very mild concentration. Maybe it's run the vacuum or clean the, clean the yard, or it might be going for a walk, or maybe it's sitting out on my back porch just thinking about my day. But at the beginning of it, I will invite the Lord in and say, Lord, if you would like to speak to me while I'm relaxing and thinking about my day or while I'm taking a walk or, or cleaning up the house or something, then please, you have... You you have my permission to speak to me. And I have discovered that as I'm doing something, 
he often will come alongside and speak to me in the process of me doing something. I found that more helpful than just sitting there waiting for something to come because then I start analyzing everything and, I, and that's not helpful to me. Fifth, God speaks to us in, by way of angelic visitation. There are, I know of faculty members on this campus who have seen angels walking on this campus. I met a, a student from Ethiopia who told me he came here to study at Talbot School of Theology, that he, had, that he had seen a number of angels on campus following after different students. And um, I actually had an experience with three angels guarding me uh, a, a few years ago. I was up at a church in Seattle speaking, and after I spoke on a Friday night, a woman came up to me and said, Dr. Moreland, thank you for your talk, but I wanted to let you know that while you were speaking for 45 minutes, there were three angels standing around you, a taller one looking over your head and two short ones on either side. Well, I thought she was nuts. <laughs> I, I had no inclination to believe her whatsoever. But I said to her, well, thank you very much, ma'am. And, uh, you know, so uh, that was, I was kind of glad that was over with. So, um, she, well, I was nice to her, but she left. Um, I went home. This was in April or May of the school year. Come to be next September... And I was going through a difficult time, and I was at home alone in, on my bed, and I prayed a prayer that I had never prayed in 35 years as a Christian. I had never once in my life ever prayed for angelic protection. I'd always prayed that the Spirit would protect me, or God the Father, or the Lord Jesus, but I never had prayed that he'd send angels to protect me. So I said, Lord, I don't know if those angels were real or not, but if they were real, and if they're not here, would you send them back to guard me because I feel vulnerable? And would you let me know they're here? And I went to sleep. About eight days later, I got an email from one of my philosophy grad students named Mark Stepp. And the email said, hi, JP, how you doing? Look, I've been wanting to send this to you for three days but I was afraid that if I sent it to you, you'd think I was crazy. And by the way, I've still got the email at home. He said, I ran it by some of the grad students, and they all agreed I needed to send you the email, so here goes. A few days ago in Meyer 109, while you were lecturing in Metaphysics 1, I saw three angels appear around you for 10 to 15 minutes, and then they vanished. And if you'd like to talk about it, I'd love to come and see you. Well, I got on the phone and said, get over here. To my office. So he comes to my office and said, Mark, I said, were they in your head or were they in the room? And he said, oh no, they weren't in my head, they were in the room. And I said, what happened? And he said, JP, there were three robed beings with no faces that appeared while you were lecturing. And he said, I drew a picture of it and I've got the picture at home. And my, my wife has seen it. There, she, there were two shorter angels on either side of me and a taller one looking over my head in this picture. And he said, I saw them, I took my glasses off, I rubbed my eyes. I thought that maybe the light was bouncing off dust in the air or something. And he said, I said, do you typically see angels? Thinking that he was a little off his rocker a little bit. And he said, I've never seen an angel in my life except maybe when I was eight years old. No, I don't see angels. And I said, well, why, why didn't you tell me? We said, yeah, Dr. Moreland, I want to interrupt class and tell you you got three angels standing around you, he says to me. He said, I felt scared sending you the email five days later. And then I told him what I'd prayed eight days before then, and he began to weep in my office because of the privilege of being used by God to bring that message to me that God was protecting me. Do not think that angels don't appear and speak to people. They do. Sometimes they come to people in their dreams. Angels are not just figments of, of our imagination in the Scriptures. The Scriptures say they're real, and they are real. How does God speak to us? Through prophetic words, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. We, the best way to do that is when you're praying over someone and give the Lord time to come. He speaks in dreams and visions. If you get a dream, don't automatically dismiss it. Run it by some of your close friends just in case it may well be the Lord. 
Sometimes he puts thoughts and feelings in our minds that come from outside of us and pass through, and you can learn to discern that pattern. Sometimes he speaks through angelic visitations, and there are two other ways. Sometimes he speaks by giving us impressions. Impressions. Now, what is an impression? An impression is a pre-linguistic way of knowing. It is a pre-linguistic way of knowing. It is a, it's not verbal. It's not something that's put in language. That would be thoughts and feelings. So by saying it's pre-linguistic, I mean it is just a sense of something. It's a sense that you're supposed to do something or that you're supposed to say something. It's a feeling or a sense of some kind that doesn't have necessarily a, a, a complete thought to it. It says, in, for example, uh, in Mark 2.8, that Jesus perceived in his heart what people were saying. He had an impression from the Spirit of God what was in the hearts of people. Now, let me give you an example of this, but I want to make a distinction between this and God putting a thought or a, a feeling in your mind. That will be a series of ideas. This is just a sense of something, okay? That's the difference. Once I was at a church um, speaking out here, and after I spoke, the, the pastor got up and said, we'd like to ask people to come forward for prayer. So I stood at the side, and about 15, maybe 20 people came forward for prayer. And I was standing there, just, just waiting, uh, and I had a strong impression that God wanted me to go talk to a specific young man that was standing in the group waiting for prayer. And I just kept getting the feeling I was to go talk to him. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Now, as I walked over toward him, God puts, gave me a word of knowledge for him, and the Spirit said, tell him that he is not to leave the ministry that he's involved in. So I put my hands on him and said, may I pray over you? And he said, I would, be, I would love it. And I just invited the Lord to come. I said, Lord Jesus, please come. We're, we're here listening. And then I said, the sense that I get is that you're not to leave the ministry you're involved in. Does that, I had no, does that mean anything to you? He, he looked up at me and says, Dr. Moreland, I, went to da I graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary I don't even believe in any of this stuff, <laughs> these words of knowledge and that sort of thing. But I came here because I wanted to hear you speak. And what you don't know is that I am involved in a ministry that I have recently been considered leaving, and I have been seeking God's guidance about the matter. And what you said to me is just what I needed to hear. Would you mind if I called you at home and talked to you further about this? And I said, I'd love to. That was an impression followed by thoughts that came into my mind by way of a word of knowledge. Now finally, God speaks to us in terms of providential circumstances. Providential circumstances, and I'll, I'll close with this. A providential circumstance is something that has two characteristics to it. It has two traits. The first is it's highly unlikely to happen. It's very improbable so it has to be an event that's very unlikely before you can know it's from God. And secondly, it has a special significance to you at that particular stage in your journey. It's got to be highly unlikely, and it's got to have special significance to you in your journey. Now, I remember years ago when I first went in the ministry with Campus Crusade for Christ, I was out in Southern California at a training session, and I was being taught how to pray. And I was taught you ought to pray specifically what you'd like God for do. And I was a new believer, and I was going back to Golden, Colorado to serve on the Colorado School of Mines campus. So I wrote in my prayer journal, Lord Jesus, I would like you to give my roommate and me a place to live that's a white house with a white picket fence with a nice grassy front yard just a few miles from campus, no more than $130 a month. And prices were lower back then, <laughs> as you know. And so I put that in my prayer journal. I went back to Golden, and I looked for three days for a place to live, and I could find absolutely nothing within 10 miles of Golden. There was, there was an apartment available, in, uh, but it was too far away. 
So I was back to ground zero after three days and having looked at about 15 places with nothing. I got a phone call that night from a Campus Crusade staff worker who said, Jay, are you looking for a place to live? She had no idea of my prayer. I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I've run out of options. She said, I was at Denver Seminary today, and on the bulletin board, there is a pastor who's listing a place in Golden. He wants to run out to Christians. Here's his number. So I called this pastor and was scheduled to meet him the next morning. And when I met him, I drove up. God is my witness to a white house surrounded by a white picket fence, a nice grassy front yard, two miles from campus, $110 a month. Now, I had a sense that God wanted me to move into that house. <laughs> okay? Now, look, if I'd gone back there and I had just found the place to live, that would have been no indication that God wanted me to move in that house. But the White House with the white picket fence was pretty clear because it had two characteristics. Number one, it was an unlikely thing to happen. Number two, it had a special significance to me because that is exactly what I was seeking the Lord about. A, a little over a year ago, my son-in-law was wanting a job where he could work in a certain field and be surrounded by solid, good people and have Christian bosses if possible. Well, in this case, guess what happened? A door opened up for him to work in an area that matched his training, and the, both of the bosses were on fire Christians. We took that to be an indication that that was an open door God was making for him because the event was unlikely to happen, and it had a special significance to him in light of what were the desires of his heart. And my, my word to you is then, if there are desires in your heart and something happens to satisfy those desires, that is unlikely to happen, it's improbable, there's a good chance the Lord is leading in that direction. Now let me close with just one final word of encouragement. Does God bring us into times of silence where we don't hear his voice? You bet. Has it happened to me for long periods of time? Are there times when God hides and withdraws his presence? Yes. Do we need to learn what to do with that? We do. And that will be the topic of tomorrow. But I maintain that we live in a supernatural world. The physical world is not all there is. There is a God. There are angels and demons. There is an unseen world, and that God communicates with his children. And the key for us is not whether God communicates. The key is learning to recognize when he does and when he doesn't. And what I've tried to do this evening is to share with you some of the ways that God speaks to his children today, and I've tried to offer some suggestions as to how you can get better at learning to discern his voice. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.